السيدات والسادة أكرر ترحيبنا بكم جميعا في أعمال مؤتمر شمال إفريقيا الدولي للموانئ والمناطق الحرة والذي نفخر جميعنا إدارة وموظفين بالمنطقة الحرة بمصراتة باحتضانه لأول مرة على مستوى شمال إفريقيا وليبيا وتحديدا في مدينة مصراتة وكي لا أطيل عليكم رحبوا معي بالسيد ستيفن كاسيمون مدير ميناء أنتوير بروج الدولية الذي سيترأس الحوارية الثانية بعنوان فرص الاستثمار في, التجا في تجارة العبور والمناطق الحرة Ladies and gentlemen, uh, warm welcome again. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to, to preside this session about uh, the, the investments uh, in, in ports and in, in, uh, in trade zones. And now, first of all, we have uh, Professor Mohamed uh, uh, Eldin Beghet. Uh, the professor is uh, a professor in financial accounting and auditing and is Dean of the College of International Transport and Logistics, Aswan South uh, Valley, the Arab Academy for Science and Technology and Maritime uh, Transport Institute. The professor obtained his uh, PhD uh, from the University of Plymouth in the UK, and he held several positions throughout his career including the head of the postgraduate studies department, vice dean of educational uh, affairs, vice dean of training and community service, assistant dean of technical affairs, master programs coordinator of investment and finance institute, consultant in maritime research and consultant center and account in a soil oil refinery. Wow, professor. You have hundreds of publications, researches, and books. The floor is yours. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم. السلام عليكم. Transit trade impact on regional economic integration. Our introduction regional economic integration, transit trade factor impact on. Transit trade and economic integration, regional perspective on transit trade and economic integration, challenge and opportunity, then conclusion.
Jesus did for me. يلعب التكامل الاقتصادي التجاري دور محوري في تشكيل الماهيكل الاقتصادي للمناطق في جميع انواع العالم. This presentation uh, explains the concept of transit trade and economic integration from regional perspective. Transit trade and economic transition prefer the dynamic nature of trade relationship and economic cooperation within regional over time. هذا المفهوم يوضح لنا طبيعة التعاون الاقتصادي بين الدول ويوضح أن هذا التعاون دائم التغير والتكيف مع الظروف المحيطة. Regional economic integration يمثل التكامل الاقتصادي بين الدول عملية تداخل الدول المجاورة في رفع مستوى التعاون من خلال المؤسسات والقواعد المشتركة. ذا إيم إذا سوري أنا مش مشغل ده. The aim of economic integration is reduce buyers and factor economic growth in involve combination of economic uh, between countries often in the same geographic region. There are many levels of regional economic integration, including free trade area, customer union, common market, common economic union, and political union. The benefit of regional economic integration include increased trade, higher invariant rate, the possible economic growth. Transit trade. What's the meaning of transit trade? A tigard a transit. تغير الدائم التجارة الدولية ترنزيت ريت ادسكريبت ذا ادابتيشن اند كونستانت ترانسفورميشن اوف ريليشن اند بانترنس اوف تايم اهم ملامح تجارة الترانزيت flexibility and adaptability globalization supply chain dynamic technical achievement policy and regulation market access the first policy and uh, first uh, flexibility تبتسم التجارة الدولية بالتغير والمرونة الدائمة فيما يتعلق بالعرض والطلب والتقدم التكنولوجي والتدفقات التجارية الغير ثابتة والاستجابة لمختلف العوامل globalization تتميز globalization انها جعلت العالم قرية واحدة وبالتالي صغرت المسافات وأصبح حاليا تجارة الترانزيت أهم مطلب موجود 
في الاستثمار ايضا عندي سبلاي شين دايناميك وتطور هيكل سلاسل امداد العالميه وتنوع طرق الانتاج وتشتت طبيعه الانتاج تقسم هذه الشبكه لسلسله الامداد في انتقال التجاره بين الدول بوليسي اند ريجريشن والسياسات واللوائح التجاريه مثل التعريف الجمركيه الحواجز التجاريه ممكن ان تغير بشكل او تتغير بشكل مستمر ومتكرر هذه التغيرات تؤثر على انماط التجاره ماركت اكسس كيفيه الوصول للماركت تتعرض امكانيه الوصول للاسواق ل أسباب متعمية منها الاستقرار السياسي تطور البنية التحتية الإصلاحات التنظيمية فاكتور إمباكت ترانزيت تريت أند أكنيميك إنتجريشن هناك عدة عوامل تؤثر على تجارة التنزيد وإحداث التكامل الاقتصادي بين الدول أولى هذه العوامل Economic Corporation uh, uh, Political Agreement Economic Corporation Infrastructure Development Technology and Digitalization and global, global economic terrain. Political agreement وتشير إلى التعاون أو التفقيات الدولية مثل التفقيات التجارة الإقليمية والمعاهدات السياسية تؤثر بشكل كبير على عملية التكامل الاقتصادي وتعزيز التعاون وتسهيل التجارة بين الدول. التعاون الاقتصادي التعاون الاقتصادي مثل الأسواق المشتركة، الاتحادات الجمركية، التكامل والكتل الاقتصادية، كل هذه العوامل ممكن أن تخلق فرص لتعزيز التجاره والاستثمار وتعزيز التكامل الاقليمي. انفرا ديفولمنت تطوير البنيه التحتيه مطلب اساسي لاحداث التجاره الترانزيت واحداث التكامل الاقتصادي حيث تمثل البنيه التحتيه للنقل والاتصالات داخل المنطقه بشكل كبير على التدفقات والتكامل الاقتصادي. لما يتيح حركة أكثر كفاءة لنقل السلع والخدمات. Political Regional Perspective on Transit and Economic Integration عندي مجموعة اتحادات دولية تشير إلى التكامل الاقتصادي أولى هذه الاتحادات كانت أوروبيان يونيون الاتحاد الأوروبي ويتميز هذا الاتحاد بعملة واحدة قواعد واحدة ولكن في الفترة الأخيرة قوبل ب تحدي كبير وهو خروج انجلترا من هذا الاتحاد وده ترتب عليه مجموعه عوائق بين اتحاد الدول الاوروبيه ايضا من الاتحادات اللي تؤثر على التكامل الاقتصادي عندي افريكان يونيون وده اتحاد بين الدول الافريقيه تحت عنوان افريقيا 
Continental Free Trade Area. أيضا عندي أشيا سبيرسفيتك ريشن ودي اتحاد دول آسيا والمحيط الأطلنطي. تقابل تجارة الترانزيت مجموعة من الشانز والأوبرتوني التحديات هي عن إكوتي عن إكوتي مقصود بها عدم المساواة بين الدول الخاضعة للتكامل الاقتصادي من حيث الدخل الطبيعة الجغرافية الكثافة السكانية وغيرها في عملية تجارة الأنترانزيت جي بروتيوميكال فاكتور أيضا من العوامل المؤثرة جي بروتيكال فاكتور اللي هي تمثل الصراعات الموجودة في المناطق الجغرافية الخاضعة لتجارة الترانزيت التنمية المستدامة وده مطلب أساسي لجميع الدول إن أنا بفضل أخميها التنمية المستدامة سنتبرال ديفولمنت والحوكمة دايما الحوكمة بتدخل في عملية إحداث التبادل بين الدول في تجارة الترانزيت أنا من رأيي أيضا هناك عوامل أخرى تؤثر على تجارة الترانزيت أهمها مصادر التمويل طبعا مصادر التمويل لو أنا اتكلمت عنها في منها قصير ومتوسط وطويل الأجل ولكن تجارة الترانزيت تعتمد اعتماد كلي على مصادر تمويل طويلة الأجل خاصة إن احنا هنا في السيشن بنتكلم على الاستثمار فالاستثمار يبدأ أولا توافر مصادر التمويل ثم كيفية توجيه تلك المصادر على الاستثمارات مصادر التمويل طويلة الأجل لو أنا هكلمها على مستوى المشروعات عندي أولى هذه المصادر إصدار السندات إصدار الأسهم سواء كانت عادية أو ممتازة القروض طويلة الأجل ده كله على مستوى المشروعات بين الدول هو الاقتراض طويل الأجل أو الدولة تصدر سندات عشان كده بنقول في أرض نأمل وده حلم مني أن يكون هناك تجارة تنزيد بين الدول العربية على مستوى اتحاد الأوروبي نعمل اتحاد عربي لتجارة الترانزيت ودي أهم توصية بحب أوصي بيها إزاي نعملها دي محتاجين نفكر فيها لتقليل الحواجز بين الدول العربية In conclusion Transit trade and economic integration manufacturing concept that reflect the dynamic of regional integration understanding the factors impact this process and regional perspective integration is critical for policy market and business negative and the ever change landscape of trade economic cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. So today uh, we, we learned from the professor collaboration between uh, nations in trade is very important uh, for uh, investors so that they, they can uh, uh, trust that their investment will be work on the, on the long time. Uh, the political climate is important and the level playing field. Uh, with and, and, and last but not least, professor, if I understand you very well, the environment, the sustainability behind the project and, and the social inclusive, 
inclusivity uh, is very important also. Thank you so much. And, and now I, I suggest we, we, uh, we, we go to uh, uh, Professor Dr. George Vagelas. Uh, the professor, warm welcome, Professor. The, the professor is Associate Professor uh, of Port and Shipping Management at the Ports Management and Shipping Department of the National and the uh, Capodestrian University of Athens. He is a founding member of uh, Port Economics, a web-based inclusive advancing knowledge exchange on port economics, management, and policies. He is, has hands-on experience in the port industry and has published more than 60 studies focusing on port economics and management, port policy as well, and shipping transport and seaport economics management and policy. Wow, Professor, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Solon. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, the Arab Academy of Science, Technology and Maritime Transport for hosting, for organizing the event and for also inviting me to be here. Is it better here? Okay, all right. And also many thanks to Ms. Jurata Free Trade uh, Zone for hosting us and providing this beautiful venue. Okay, so my presentation is about uh, port investments. Um, I'm going to present you the case of Greek ports, uh, and especially how the private sector has uh, helped us, uh, I mean, assistant the Greek ports towards a more competitive operation and management. Okay, let me see. All right. A few words first. Uh, European ports and as well as uh, global ports went under several waves of port reforms back in 1990s and 2000. In the case of Europe, we had the port reform in the Spanish ports at the beginning of 1990s and the Italian ports at the mid of 1990s. Uh, these reforms were mainly the result of the increasing globalization of the global trade, uh, which means additional volume for ports, which means that we need additional infrastructures and capacity. So we need money. And uh, also we have changes in the geography and organization uh, of the production and consumption side, and especially after the uh, after China joined the uh, World Trade Organization back in 2000. All this, of course, have been combined with uh, an increased concentration, especially in the line of shipping services, uh, where we have alliances, pools, mergers, and acquisition between several companies. Now, all this resulted in uh, the rationale, as we call it, of port devolution. Where this means that we need to change the governance model of ports, uh, aiming to increase the port's competitiveness. And, uh, the major outcome of changing the port uh, governance model of our port system is to increase port performance. So these are the four well-known uh, models of uh, private participation in, uh, in uh, ports. It's based from uh, the Port Reform Toolkit of World Bank, Bank in 90, back in 1970s. This is more or less the case of Greece. We started from uh, pure public ports, state-owned, operated by the state, managed and financed by the state. Uh, we passed through the tool port model and uh, even we exceeded the landlord port model. Right now in Greece, I can say that we uh, apply a unique port governance model because uh, the majority of the European ports are operated under the landlord port model, such as the port of Antwerp. But in Greece, we went well beyond this. Uh, we privatized the port authority. I think uh, we are the only European uh, country that has privatized its port authorities. So this is the wave of privatization uh, uh, globally. Here you can see the private participation in port infrastructures, I mean the private investments. And you, as you can see, we have uh, uh, a peak back in 2013. And this was due to some major private port investments in uh, Nigeria, especially the uh, port of Leki and the port of Pone. But as you can see, there is an increasing trend in uh, the participation of the private sector in the port industry. And this is what has been happened, uh, has happened in the Greek case. The last two decades, uh, uh, I can say that we started too late uh, compared with other European countries back in 1999. Uh, so if we want to, let's say, review the port governance, uh, the, the port devolution, uh, history of the Greek ports, we can identify three different phases. The first one is the corporatization phase, 
between 1999 and 2004. In this uh, period, the majority of the major Greek ports have been corporatized, operating as societe anonymes. With uh, two of them, the Port of Piraeus Authority and the Thessaloniki Port Authority, these are the two biggest ports in Greece, uh, during the, the Athens Stock Exchange. The second phase was between 2008 and 2009, when we applied uh, the landlord port model, as in any other European country, uh, countries, um, by concessioning the container terminal at the Port of Piraeus. Uh, the concessioner was Costco, uh, a terminal operator that is linked with one of the major shipping lines around the world. And finally, uh, since 2016, Greece has entered in the new phase of port reform by privatizing, uh, actually, uh, we can say de facto privatization of the Greek port. Uh, and we have done that through the sale of the port authorities. In 2016, we sold, uh, uh, we sell the majority stakes of the Piraeus Port Authority to a private operator, which again was Costco. And uh, we continued with 2018 by selling the Port Authority, the majority of the stakes of the Port Authority of the second biggest port in Greece, the Port of Thessaloniki, to another private operator. Uh, this is a consortium uh, in which uh, Terminal Link, which is a, a, a port operator linked with CMSSM, is participating. Nevertheless, uh, today we have two more ports that have been privatized, the port of Gumenitsa and the Kavala, but I'm going to tell you more on this on the uh, uh, on the slides to come. And this is the Greek port system as has been formed today. We have two major ports that have been privatized, the port of Piraeus and the port of Thessaloniki. We have two more ports that has been sold recently. And we are in the process of selling seven more ports to private companies. Uh, on the right, as you can see the, uh, the screen, there are some data about the Greek port system. We have more than 1,000 port facilities. I mean, even uh, small ports with a dock. 32.6 uh, million tons of cargos are passing through the Greek, the Greek ports and 6.15 million KUs. Uh, no need to say that 90. 4% of these uh, volumes of the use are passing through the port of Piraeus. Oh, sorry, and here there are some headlines from uh, international media uh, when we decided to privatize the port of Piraeus. Uh, let's say, assuming that the port will uh, change uh, speed and will be one of the major European ports. And to tell you the truth, okay, uh, I can say that the privatization of Port of Piraeus created a lot of benefits to the Greek economy. As you can see here, this is the Piraeus port connectivity uh, as regards the European uh, uh, perspective and more, more actually the uh, uh, Mediterranean perspective. The Port of Piraeus is well connected to almost any port in the Mediterranean. As you can see also, we have uh, uh, they, uh, sorry, weekly connections with all three Libyan ports, Mizurata, um, uh, Benghazi, and Tripoli. Uh, also, we have, I mean, as a port, uh, the Port of Piraeus is directly connected with 30 countries and 78 ports around the world. Uh, we have uh, direct itineraries from uh, major ASEAN ports like Port Klang, Singapore, uh, Port of Colombo, and uh, many other ports. And we can see that the privatization of the port of uh, Piraeus, uh, along with the fact that the new operator is a major shipping line, has helped Greece to uh, increase the, the liner shipping connectivity index. Uh, this is the index shown in the, the bottom uh, right part of the screen. Uh, right now, Greece is, the, is in the 20th uh, place in the world as regards the liner shipping connectivity. And this is more or less can be attributed to the fact that the Port of Piraeus is operated by Costco. And this is the impact of uh, the privatization of ports on the port throughput. As you can see, uh, between uh, 2007, 2008, when we started to privatize the port through a concession to Costco, first of all, and then by selling the port authority back in 2016, uh, the volume of uh, containers has been more than uh, quadruple. Uh, we went from almost 1 million TAUs to 5.2 million TAUs the last few years. Uh, the capacity of the port is around 7.2. So uh, 
in the next few years, we will probably need to expand further the container internal of the pool. And despite uh, that many in Greece expect that the port will be um, a Chinese, let's say, uh, land, a Chinese uh, soil, uh, actually, it keeps to be a, a multi-user port. I mean, as you can see here, Costco has only 24%, one quarter of the poles at the port. Also, the Ocean Alliance, in which Costco uh, participates and is the leader, uh, holds almost half of the poles at the port of Piraeus. But nevertheless, this is uh, Piraeus is keep operating as a multi-user port. And here are a brief, uh, let's say, resume of the investments that the Chinese companies uh, invested in uh, the port of Piraeus. In total, we have more than 1 billion euros of investments. As you can see here, uh, 600 million have been invested during the concession phase between 2009 and 2016. And uh, following the sale of the 67% of the shares, there is uh, an obligation of um, the new operator of Costco to invest 293 uh, more million euros, as well as uh, the Chinese have decided to invest 167 more million, uh, sorry, additional millions to optional investments. And as I said before, apart from the Port of Piraeus, which is I mean, the core of the Greek port system. The Greek port system is consisted by 12 other ports operating as on means. Uh, right now, four of them have been sold, and we are expecting that seven more are going to be sold in the next five years. So uh, we believe that there will be additional investment opportunities for private operators in the Greek port system. And here is a brief uh, description of the other uh, private investments we had in Greece. Uh, recently, we concessioned the cargo terminal in the port of Kavala. It's, it's a small port, but we managed to take uh, 36 million in investments plus 34 million uh, uh, the price of, of, this, uh, of this sale. Also, we sold the port of Volos and the port of Heraklion to uh, the port of Heraklion in Dumenica has been sold to a well-known liner shipping company, which is uh, the Grimaldi Lines. Uh, and if someone of you ask, okay, is this the proper, let's say, uh, policy, the proper strategy uh, for attracting private investments in ports? I would say yes, that, okay, we have some benefits. We have several benefits. We have increasing connectivity of the country. Uh, we have increasing investments. We have increasing traffic. But nevertheless, we abolished, uh, I mean, as a country, the right to uh, regulatory to regulate, let's say, the port market, and of course to control the port market to avoid market distortions. Right now, we have privatized the port authority, which means that Costco, if of course the Chinese guys wants, they can do everything they want in the port of Piraeus. Okay, so just to conclude, um, we had the financial crisis in Greece back in 2010 2017 that forced us to uh, sell. Uh, the port authorities aiming at uh, gaining some quick money uh, for uh, the uh, public uh, spending, the public uh, uh, accounts. And of course, uh, and there's no need to say that the remaining eight ports that are operate under the state-owned regime are uh, under, let's say, strict political intervention, including uh, rationalization in appointing the port administration. And these are the, we can say, the direct benefits by the Piraeus port privatization in Greece. We have, uh, we developed additional infrastructures with private investments. Uh, the Chinese upgraded the cargo handling equipment at the port of Piraeus. Also, they applied the port management reform that, based on the evaluation of the port users, seems to work better than the previous state management. And of course, we have an increase in port efficiency. Also, the last two years, we can see some signs of, uh, I can, let's say, uh, congestion at the port of Piraeus. Uh, so this is why the Chinese guys are trying to find some land around the port of uh, Piraeus to develop a new pier for the containers. Okay, so this is just briefly the case of the Greek ports. And let me thank you for being here and for your attention. Thank you.
much, uh, Professor. Uh, today we, we learned from you uh, the, the 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 dynamic uh, environment in in the Greek uh, ports uh, and 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 how the the model changed from a two port to a landlord port to even to private port with the the nice example of of Costco in in uh, Piraeus. Uh, which gave an increase of business, uh, which uh, did not hinder other shipping lines to to come to Piraeus, such as uh, MSC and, and Apac Lloyd. Uh, and uh, Costco invested one billion dollars uh, in 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 the port itself, which is amazing, uh, in in infrastructure, in equipment, and in efficiency. Wow. Now, I, I th thank you so much, Professor. And I suggest we, we go to, to Mr. Nico. So, uh, Mr. Nico is, is, is a dear colleague of mine and he is a project manager within our within our team uh, running amongst others the project in in Suriname Paramaribo uh, and he also worked on the different projects we have in at the moment in Malaysia in, in Cotonou um, and yeah he's a proficient and competent uh, lecturer in APEC seminars uh, for all APEC programs related to port management strategic master planning business development and and marketing now nico is also the driver uh, behind our mou we have with with the port training institute uh, and i am ha so happy that that nico is always so enthusiastic to 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 go to deep dive in our projects and now nico uh, i give you the floor to, to explain uh, about challenges and opportunities in the global supply chain. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan. Yeah, so uh, indeed, uh, like Stefan said, I'm uh, very, let's say, uh, yeah, um, uh, happy to be here. Eh? So uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organization. I want to thank uh, Miserata Free Zone and also our partners from the uh, Arab Academy and, and PTI. So, um, Throughout my presentation, so Stefan explained a bit more earlier about really what the Port of Antwerp is doing. Yeah? You know what 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 the activities there are, what uh, focusing on the logistics in the trade in the containers. Um, as for my presentation, it's more, let's say the. The basis, of course, is also a bit about sharing best practices of, of, of Antwerp, but focusing a bit more on the governance part and and also yeah, where we as a port authority are going uh, to tackle the challenges and the future challenges that lie ahead uh, in logistics and in, in the energy transition. Uh, so um, let's go. Uh, so first of all, Indeed, I think it's really important to say that although we have mentioned quite similar times, we're talking about the Port of Antwerp, but actually it's the Port of Antwerp Bruges. Huh? So uh, uh, one year ago, we merged with the uh, the second biggest port in Belgium, which is the Port of Bruges. Uh, and as you can see here, both are uh, very lovely cities. So if you have a chance to, to come to Antwerp or to Bruges one day, please, please, I uh, would invite you to do so for sure. Um, but obviously, yeah, we didn't just do it because it's two nice cities. <laughs> there is an economic reason behind it. And that's already actually the first challenge, you know, the first the first solution to tackle all these disruptive elements in, in this logistical supply chain is partnerships, uh, doing things together. Uh, don't act alone, but rely on partners in your community. And that's all the reasons, that's also the reason why we did this merge. Huh? So the platform in Bruges has its opportunities, has its specific cargo. They're very good in the energy section. And so we have the Fluxus gas terminal, while Antwerp is more of the 
yeah, let's say the traditional uh, container port, the, the traditional uh, 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 general cargo and bulk port. So the idea is very simple. Uh, instead of just fighting each other and treating each other as competitors, join forces and make one plus one three. Basically, it's pretty straightforward. Huh? So we created one port authority and also one governance model. So we have one uh, uh, one harbor regulations, one police regulations, one concession policy now. So it's all aligned. And in the end, the customer, our clients, our concessionaires should uh, get the benefit from it. And here you see what I just tried to explain you is one of the things, you know, this one port authority. But this is everything that's coming to us and also towards you. Huh? So a lot of disruptive global drivers. Nothing is the same anymore and everything can change overnight. Uh, a, a practical example, very practical, was the, the COVID, you know, uh, the COVID pandemic change the whole supply chain, change the whole logistics in just like overnight. And as a port, you need to react, you need to adapt and you need to be ready to face those challenges. Uh, so I'm talking just COVID now as a practical example, but demographic growth, climate change, the energy transition, uh, resources uh, that, that are becoming more scarce, shifting of economic powers, you can, there are so many, these are just a few, but maybe in reality, there are 10, 20, 30 of those type of challenges coming our way. So we cannot rely just anymore on our traditional uh, a traditional port model. So we have to think about sustainability. We have to think about transition in energy, transition in technology and Collaboration for us, a very important word. So again, I'm going to stress out it a few more times, I think, but uh, uh, yeah, partner up, team up, collaborate together. That's what we think at least is one of the key solutions to go forward. And what we did as a port authority, we had to also reinvent ourselves. Don't be that, let's say, that that passive passive company anymore, that passive authority, uh, but be proactive. Uh? And also to, to, to do that, we created a whole different new strategic plan. Also, our organization needed to adapt and to be much more open communi into communication and in dialogue. And now we have a, a, a strategy based on three pillars, which is sustainable growth and connectivity, resilience in a unique ecosystem, and transition uh, in leadership in energy and digital transition. So we're talking about sustainability, not in sustainability in a, in a way it's, it's it's in two ways you know it's sustainable economic growth uh, looking to find ways to keep on growing as a port but in a more sustainable way and sustainable also obviously has let's say we're talking about making it more green reducing emissions in the port uh, lowering on co2 uh, carbon carbon emissions uh, we also want to <clears throat> Excuse me. We also want to strengthen our position in the global supply chain uh, because I will show you uh, in a few moments a slide where, yeah, also there everything is changing. Yeah, you have vertical uh, integration, you have horizontal integrations, you have alliances, shipping lines teaming up, shipping lines trying to get more in a firm, let's say, uh, handle on the on 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 everything that's happening in the supply chain. Uh, so we as a port authority also need to react to that. Uh, and then finally, this transition in energy, where which is coming more and more important. Huh? Uh, I don't have to, 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 to say that. Uh, I think, uh, at least for us, it's clear. But uh, our port, uh, by 2035, is just EU regulations. We need to reduce our emissions by 50%. And by 2050, we need to go to zero emissions, which is for us as a port, a huge challenge because now 
we are still the number one polluter in Belgium with like 80 million tons of CO2 emissions per year. So we are the number one polluter and we need to go to zero. And to do that, again, yeah, it's just not in our capability to do that alone. We need international partners to change, to face that challenge together. So these are some of the challenges. Uh, we, we have this sustainable growth, but we also see, okay, we also, in the end, we as a port authority, we need to make money. <laughs> so we can talk about sustainable growth, but we also have to find solutions to get more revenue because of that. Uh, our revenue model is more and more pressurized because we have to do a lot of investments in the green sector, for example. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah, okay, that's all fine. But how we make money with it, you know, how we how we are going to make a revenue model from building wind farms or solar panel plants uh, in in the port, while our traditional revenue comes from fossil fuels. So big challenge there uh, in the supply chain. I just uh, already explained it in a bit. Uh, like you have the horizontal versus the vertical integrations. First, you had alliances, you had shipping lines joining teams, making agreements, things like that. But all those things that, that put pressure on what you as an authority, as a port, do. Eh? So that's very, very, uh, very difficult uh, to, to manage. So also there, partnerships, team up in new alliances. And then finally, the energy transition phase. Uh, so... Uh, industrial transition, uh, a new cargo based on the on the changing energy landscape. Um, so these are the things that we are doing for the years to come. Okay, so uh, embracing the role. So what does a port authority do? We operate, we regulate. We are also now still a landlord port, but we need to become a more proactive role. So the role of the community builder, again, finding partners is becoming more and more and more important. Um, yeah, just this is the slide that I wanted to go to about this in integration strategy. So now we see that shipping lines are actually taking more and more control of the complete supply chain. They want to manage everything from A to Z. So it's not only about the cargo on the ship, but you also want to do the transport on the land, and they also want to do the warehousing and get do do it door to door. You know, from the from the first from the first part of the production process to the end client, but also there, we need to react as a port authority, and that's not an easy thing because actually the shipping lines are getting stronger within the port. If there's a concession. For the, for the container, but there's also a concession for the transport and the concession for the warehousing of the same operator. Yeah, we lose control as port authority. Yeah? So not easy there. And then here you see the, the energy and feedstock. So this is the hub of the future. This is actually what our port platform is going to look like in the not so, in the near future, actually. So changing from this traditional model of importing crude oil, importing gas, storaging, using it in the chemical industry and exporting the chemical products to the client, we see the future <coughs> is going to be much more about reducing CO2 emissions, so CO2 capture programs, uh, reusing waste to create energy, uh, import biogas, uh, and import hydrogen that we can use in our chemical cluster and then taking it to the clients from there. So as a final one, I wanted to, uh, maybe to show you this one. So this is the real situation how we do it in Antwerp now. This is a very practical strategy that Antwerp is doing. And also there, the aspect of the partners come up. Huh? So. Uh, you have to look for it from left to right, so starting from the supply. So we are now in 2023. That's actually what we are doing now. We're looking for these partners. Uh, uh, we have signed several MOUs with countries like Namibia, uh, Angola, Chile. Uh, we are working uh, together with uh, with Egypt. Could also be potentially interesting for 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 Libya. 
uh, but we are in that phase. But in the end, we want to get the grip of the whole so supply chain starting 2023, but also provide the necessary infrastructure in our port. So creating more pipelines, for example, more uh, facilities to service this hy those hydrogen carriers. And in the final one, also go for the offtake, you know, getting this green energy towards the client. Huh? So to end maybe a very practical, to end maybe, but get with a practical uh, note. So the idea would be that countries that can make green energy like wind, because of the wind and the sun, can create a green, uh, let's say uh, green electricity to produce hydrogen. So we have green hydrogen and then import it in the port of Antwerp via carriers and consume it and in our port platform. That's one of a practical example I want to finish with my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Nico. Uh, so Nico was explaining us uh, how uh, port authorities are, are uh, facing disruptive uh, drivers, such as the, the energy, the climate, uh, and how they uh, need to reduce their greenhouse gases and what impact it has, uh, for instance, in Antwerp on the petrochemical industry with the evolution to, to green hydrogen, the role of the shipping lines, which we saw also with the two previous uh, esteemed speakers, uh, the scale of growth of the shipping lines, their impact on the port authority, which is also impacting investors. So I, I suggest we go to, to you, esteemed public, uh, for, for some questions. It was, uh, my name is Captain Jos Lecher from uh, Logistical Consulting International Canada. Uh, very interesting presentation from the panel. Uh, the question I have, you know, we see, uh, and I've been following Antwerp and Bridge, uh, Fusion, and all the success behind that. And we heard from uh, George, uh, the privatization of uh, Greek sports. Um, I have been myself uh, 30 years with port authorities in Canada. And my question to George, uh, and maybe for, to the rest of the panel, uh, what was the uh, value creation, you know, after this privatization, because I saw in your slide talking about efficiency, but at the end of the day, you know, looking back, the job creation, you know, the net revenue for ports, and also the um, um, what was lost m moving from uh, a public entity to a private entity. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question, first of all. Uh, Indeed, we can say that uh, the benefits for the from the privatization of the port of Piraeus was not the ones that we expected as a country, I mean. But we have to take also into account the framework in which this privatization took place. I mean, we have to go back in 2016. Greece was in a deep economic crisis. Uh, we lost around 25% of the country's GDP. We have an unemployment of 30%. So at that time, uh, we wanted to sell the port of Piraeus. I have to say from the beginning that this was the wrong strategy. I mean, to sell the private, uh, sorry, the port authority. It has never been done in Europe. So I'm criticizing this uh, port governance model from the beginning. But going back, so we are in 2016, we are desperately for FDIs, for indirect investments. And at that time, only one company came and provide an offer for the Port of Piraeus. And this was Costco. And of course, it was something expected. I mean, because Costco was at the Port of Piraeus since 2009. Uh, he was the only uh, operator actually at the Port of Piraeus. So uh, indeed, at that time, we had some benefits. But if you look at on the long term, I believe that this was not the right decision. Uh, for, for the good government. Okay, we took 1 billion euros in uh, investments. We created around 2,000 new jobs uh, at the Port of Piraeus. But what is the, what is the value added for the Greek economy? I mean, 
uh, we saw very well the, the case of Antwerp. You are a logistics center there. I mean, you are repackaging, you are re uh, label sorry, labeling the uh, the cargos. You are creating value for your economy. Actually, Piraeus right now is mainly a transshipment port, which means that the cargos are coming at port and then they are just leaving the next day for another port. So they are not actually creating a huge uh, uh, value added for the Greek economy. So apart from the investments and uh, the taxes that the Chinese guys are paying to the Greek state, uh, I cannot say that this was a beneficial privatization at the end of the day, okay? And especially because we abolished the uh, Port Authority and we saw that in the case of uh, Advert in the previous slide, that the Port Authority is actually the regulator of the port. So we abolished the right to regulate our own port. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Uh Yes, it was also to you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. My question is, thank you for this presentation. My question to Mr. Nico. So you have mentioned that a lot of challenges uh, facing Port of Authority, especially for how the shipping lines are, uh, shipping line are interference in, in, in everything, I think. So according what you have mentioned that you have agreement with the EU to reach uh, zero emissions. So how you can tackle this position? And as we know, to reach that agreement, we need a lot of money, a lot of technology, a lot of so. So could you tell us what's the initiative yeah, that, that you have made? Thank you. Uh, yeah, your, uh, thank you for the question. It's a very interesting one. It's also not, unfortunately for us, not so easy to answer. You know, it comes from a, a, a number of ways. And there is, we don't have a manual or a guidebook that says this is the solution. We, but, but I think in terms of, of strategy, we are going uh, the right way. Huh? So uh, to get to this zero emissions, for example, as to come from 80 million tons to zero, you are always going to see emissions in the port that's never going to if you come to the port in 2050 there will still be emissions the uh the the being emission free is going to come from compensation programs you know uh to to, to compensate and to, to 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 store for example co2 emissions in empty oil fields those are not wild ideas that's that those are projects that are actually happening now and the most uh I think the most uh, concrete example is what we call this hydrogen coalition. So we are teaming up with partners around the world where there is enough possibility to make green electricity via solar, via wind mostly. And we can use this electricity to split the hydrogen, to split the water and to create energy. And the challenge of course is going to be <laughs> to transport these molecules, bring them to the port of Antwerp where we can consume them. And that's what we at least believe is one of the solutions to get to this zero emissions. Uh, to add on what my colleagues have said, uh, uh, thank the panelists for a very insightful uh, discussions. My question is to George. You mentioned that in 2008, a tender for concessioning of uh, one of the ports, I think the second biggest port in Greece, was cancelled. It would be interesting to know why that tender was cancelled. And also, the figures you showed uh, when the shares in the ports were sold everything was 67%, 67%. Why 67%? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, actually, I didn't have a lot of time uh, to, to share all the information because there are a lot of, of, uh, of things to, to be said about the Cree case. So just to answer to the first uh, uh, of your question, yes, indeed, back in 2008, the Greek state launched two tenders. 
The first one was the concession for the container terminal of the port of Piraeus, which was successful. And the second one was for the container terminal of the port of Saloniki, the second biggest in Greece. Uh, this terminal has a capacity of half a million TAU uh, on an annual base. Indeed, it was also a successful tender. Uh, the winning party was Hudson Port Holdings. Um, but one year after, they decided to withdraw uh, their interest from the port of Saloniki. The official, uh, let's say, uh, excuse from the port of, uh, from the uh, Hudson Port Holdings, it was that in 2009, we had the economic crisis. So they said that it was uh, not the time, the proper time to proceed with a huge investment. So let's wait and see. But the actual, I believe, uh, reason was that Hudson Port Holdings has offered almost 900 million euros for this small terminal for the period of 35 years. While the second bidder, who was, uh, I think, uh, Dubai Ports, gave 400 million euros. So they, they gave twice the amount of the second bidder. So I believe that the actual reason was, okay, let's go withdraw now. Let's pay the 5 million euros, which was the penalty. And when the, uh, the tender is going to be launched again, we will offer a more uh, suitable, let's say, uh, amount of money. And going back to your second question, which was about the 67%. For the biggest port, um, the port of Piraeus of Saloniki, 25% of the shares are listed on the Athens Stock Exchange. So if you add it, it's, we are going up to 92% of the shares. 67 belongs to the private operator and 25 is publicly listed. The other 8% has been held by the state just to has, uh, let's say one representative in the BOD of the port. This is the reason. Uh, and the, the same is the reason for the other ports. I mean, we sold the 67%, which is uh, what we call the statutory um, um, part of the, of the share that gives to the new operator the right to do anything in the port. And the state holds 33% just to have two members of the BOD to just observe what are the decisions taken in, uh, in, in the port. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. Uh, I suggest uh, if there are, uh, is there an, another question? If not, we, we will have I have, a, I have a question, actually. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, so, just a short one. Um, it's about the port of Antwerp and uh, Zebris. Um, based on the new, on the merge, after, after the merging of the new port authorities, is there any plan for port specialization or they are going to operate as is right now, I mean? Operate. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I mean, port specialization. If, if, for example, uh, the port of Breeze is going to focus on some markets, and the port of Antwerp is going to focus on some other markets, or they are going to operate as is right now. I mean, uh, no, it's like a, yeah. I think it's like I said. So, so uh, the idea, the whole idea behind it is to make one plus one three, make the synergies, uh, make the connections, and use the strengths of both. Uh, you know, we we were. 10, not so long, on 10, 15 years, we were even competitors, you know, we were stealing each other's containers uh, and, and it's, was, yeah, it's, it's, it was just not efficient. Uh, so now, uh, mostly we're going to use yeah, the strengths, obviously, for, for Zebrush is the direct access to the sea, it supports at the, at the shore, at the North Sea, and they have huge uh, gas facilities, Fluxus is there, they import, I don't know, 20% of, of, of the gas co comes from the Fluxus terminal. Uh, and we are now actually doing a lot of projects on, uh, let's say, uh, improving connectivity between the two ports. So creating pipeline systems, creating a new rail between, because it's now actually one port. Uh, so uh, again, it's it's a challenge. It's not. It's also, also again not happening overnight. And it's because I say it in one minute, but it, there's a lot to do with it. Uh, but in the end, yeah, uh, use the strengths of board platforms and make both of them better. That's the idea. So much. Uh, I suggest we we go for the picture, and I invite uh, Mr. Wissam to come with us, and uh, Ms. Masra to come with us for the picture.